We are truly honored to have with us today the Reverend Al Sharpton, a man who has been called the most prominent civil rights activist in the nation by the New York Daily News. Reverend, Reverend Sharpton is the founder and president of the National Action Network, a nonprofit civil rights organization in Harlem, uh, with nearly 50, 50 chapters nationwide. His direct action movements have been credited with inspiring laws and racial, racial profiling and instigating police departments reform across the country. Presidents George W. Bush and President Barack Obama have praised him for his work. Today, he has become a leader in the fight for working families and public services throughout this nation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Reverend Al Sharpton. Thank you very much, and thank you for that introduction, uh, and certainly to all of you that have gathered from the labor as well as civil rights and clergy leadership, I'm very honored to be here today, and my long-standing friend, uh, the pastor of this church, Dr. Winters, who just concluded 38-year celebration as the pastor of this church. And I might add that uh, Dr. Winters invited me to San Diego when everybody didn't want me to come to San Diego. And also when I wasn't slim enough to jump up on the stage. Let me say, I think that what Lee Saunders and I have tried to do is of particular importance in San Diego. At the end of the election cycle last year, to be specific, the morning after the midterm elections, Lee Saunders, who I and he and I have worked together for a decade and a half over issues when he led AFSCME in New York and on and on, he picked up the phone and called me and said that I think that the fact that the right wing has taken over the Congress in many states is going to lead to some serious problems for workers and for communities of color and working class people. And in order to resist this, we're going to need to expand the labor community and the civil rights community and come together because if we don't, there are some dark days ahead. I agreed, and we met in Washington and began planning and getting others involved nationally. Little did I know how prophetic Lee was, because the immediate result of the midterm elections was to scapegoat working people and to protect the rich and the corporations and to demonize those that were public workers and therefore the president as their way to one, save the rich, and secondly, maintain power for the right wing. All over this country, you would think from what is going on in state legislative houses, gubernatorial houses, and municipal referendums, one that is being planned here now, that it was city workers many of whom had already taken wage freezes and layoffs and freezes in pensions, you would think you all caused the economic problem that we're in. If you were to just land here for Mars, you would say, well, the problem is not that Wall Street ran amok unregulated, not that the top rich in this country has gotten richer. Problem is those greedy city workers who have the nerve to want pensions that they paid into. If you have an illness, the prescription should be toward what the ailment was. 
Well, if the, if the illness, if the economic problem was the rich being unregulated, the wealthy not being taxed properly and equally, corporations being able to outsource jobs and also outsource their taxes. If that is what caused the ailment, how is the prescription not addressing the ailment? So I got a head cold and you give me, me, prescription drugs. Might be good for my knee, but it's not going to solve my head cold. But we're dealing in the politics of distraction. You know, I come from New York. They have a place in New York called Times Square. Times Square, they got a con game called Three Card Monty. Not that I played it, Reverend Renters, but I heard about it from some of the fellas. And the object of three card money is they put down three cards, they put a stone on the one of the cards, and they play the game of you guessing which card the stone is under. And if you can't guess the right stone, they get your money. And people literally make a living like that. Well, what they're playing is the three card Monty game here. They're playing with the public's eyes that will move this around. And if we move it fast enough and slick enough and get enough right wing journalists, we will make you think the stone is under the wrong card. So you will end up thinking that you are protecting taxpayers by letting them give a tax break to the rich, tax break to the corporations, but take away pensions from people that invested to pay for it. That's three card money game. You will act like the problem with education is not those that want to cut the budget, but teachers that come to work every day trying to make kids learn against the odds. Three card Monte, put the blame where it doesn't belong. You will say to blacks and Latinos, minorities, problem is unions. That's our problem. Well, when we look at the history of every union is not correct, there are things we got to deal with in labor, and there are things labor got to deal with with us. But if you look historically, and we've been allied with labor a lot more than we have with major corporations. Labor was there in the civil rights movement. Labor was there for when we started electing people all over the country progressive. Labor was there for Obama. Private corporations and the right wing were always on the other side. So do you deal with a marriage that has had one or two arguments, or do you deal with those that have never been involved with you? and would only be engaged with you in the dark. I mean, it, it, it's insulting. You know, this August, we are dedicating the monument to Martin Luther King in Washington. It'll be the first time in the history of this country a non-president, Joan, will have a monument on the banks of the Potomac. In fact, in fact, only three presidents have it, Lincoln, Washington, and Jefferson. The day before the final ceremony, Lee Saunders and I are going to lead with Labor and Civil Rights Group a rally and march around jobs. We're going to march from Lincoln Memorial to the King Monument to show the growth from Dr. King making that speech that very day in front of Lincoln Memorial, now he has a monument. And a reporter asked me in uh, Los Angeles uh, last night, why are y'all doing that, labor and civil rights on the King Monument weekend? I said, well, do you know Dr. King was killed in Memphis for a garbage strike? by asking me the union, Lee Saunders is the international secretary treasurer of, and he was on his way to Washington to lead a poor people's campaign where he wanted to pitch Resurrection City, which would have been tense to show poor people 
black, white, Chicano, uh, Latino, Asian, all over the country, and they pitch a tent there, and do you know near the ground he wanted to lay those tents is the ground we're going to build that monument? So you don't understand Dr. King if you don't understand the Coalition of Labor and Civil Rights. And those ministers that question working with labor need to take Dr. King's picture down in their church. If you want to preach tax cuts to the rich, trickle down economics, take down King, put up Henry Ford's picture. Let your folk know what you really preaching. But don't distort history to cover up some right-wing philosophy. Because the reason we even have the right for some of us to even be in entrepreneurial endeavors is because civil rights and labor people paid the price for us to have that right. I tell elected officials all over the country, we just had a vote that I felt was absolutely anti-people in New Jersey last, in the last week. And we met with some of the black elected officials who sit up now with this great objectivity. Well, we've got to deal with the reality of the budget, yes. And we've got to deal with how we deal with our colleagues, yes. But let's not get amnesia. Your colleagues didn't bring you here. So just like we must understand how you got to deal with your colleagues, your colleagues have to understand you have to deal with your constituents. Because if your constituents' interest is not served, it is in their interest to put someone there that served them. And then do not allow them to put you on the defensive. They will ask, why is labor and ministers and all of y'all got Lee Saunders and Al Sharpton in town? But if Sarah Palin come and any other right wing national, y'all don't ask them who sent for them. San Diego is a tourist town. I roll in here, they tell me how I can spend money at all of the sites. So let me get this right, I can come in here and spend money, but I can't come in here and align with those that want to preserve living wages for folks. So I'm invited to spend money in town, but I'm not invited to help people make money in town. Welcome to San Diego unless you're going to stand up for the people. So if they don't want national figures in town, tell them that Bachman and Palin and, and the rest of them can't come to town either. But as long as they can call in their national friends, then you can call in yours, and I'll be back over and over again if they put this referendum on the ballot. Let me also say in a broader picture, what we're looking at, you that study history, is a renewed states' rights movement. What they have done, and Lee Saunders saw it coming, with the victory of last year's midterm elections, is renewed a states' rights movement. They want to go state by state now to determine labor rights, collective bargaining, immigration, all that state's rights. So whether it's Wisconsin on collective bargaining, whether it's Arizona or Alabama on immigration, what they're trying to do is establish the undermining of a strong national government to protect people against those interests that would privately put us back in the pre-1950s. That's what they mean when they say take America back. Back from who? To who? That is 
is why what Joan and others are doing and trying to coalesce with people in the community is important. Because as long as you have a states' rights movement, all of us suffer. When I went to Arizona, help lead the march of immigration, some blacks said, what are you out there for? If there's states' rights against Mexicans, once you establish states' rights, it's going to come all full circle. And it is. They now do them voter ID, states' rights. Well, you got to show your voter ID in some states to vote. Cuts down the black vote. Some cities, 61% of black men don't even have a driver's license. Senior citizens don't have a driver's license. Most of us don't have a passport because most of us can't afford to go nowhere. They're cutting back states' rights on early voting, on same-day registration and vote, because they figured out that the new way to deny voting rights, the new poll tax, is to change the voting scenario. Well, I'm not talking theory. Last Thursday in the Wall Street Journal, not that I read the Wall Street Journal, Lee lent me his copy. <laughs> Carl Rove wrote, if we can just bring the black vote down a couple of percents in North Carolina, it changes the electoral map and we can win in 2012. This is not about budgets. This is about them changing the paradigm that we have established in the last half century in this country. This is about their trying to gain power for some of the most reactionary forces that want the rich to get richer at the expense of the poor and will have fun playing us off against each other. And having us fight like crabs in the barrel. I told them in Wisconsin, the way you stop crabs in the barrel from fighting, somebody said to me, well, we're all fighting. How do we stop the crabs in the barrel? The reason crabs in the barrel are fighting each other is that they won't come together and tear the lid off, lid off the barrel, and there'll be enough room for everybody. Problem is the lid. So we crawling over each other if we got together and pushed the lid off the top of the barrel. We'd all be free enough to spread our claws out. But they're playing games with us. And we've got to be smart enough and intelligent enough to fight together. Do you realize that Martin Luther King changed this country and never had a cell phone? Even a brand of organized workers never knew what the internet was. Ministers from Bishop Charles Harrison Mason to Richard Allen built denominations and never had technology. And here we are in the 21st century with all these ways to communicate. Internet, laptops in every room, Twitter, Facebook, MySpace, Black Bear in one pocket, two cell phones in the other, and you can't get five folk together to protect their own jobs? We've lost our will and we've lost the ability to put what we live for above just our own self-aggrandizement. And they have everybody in a corner trying to profile and position rather than saying we got to do something for the whole and you will get your profile out of the work you do. Life is about what you are born to do, serving a purpose. Having a big title and no function means nothing. Being in charge of a big name that has no meaning means nothing. At the end of the day, if these people are unemployed, if they're uninsured, if people can't take care of their health care, who cares what your title is? Who cares what your position is? History will say that we were the generation that lost it all. Had more to work with and did less with it. Dr. Winters can tell you he's been passing here 38 years. Hardest job of a preacher is to preach the funeral of an irrelevant person. That's a hard job. They roll the body down the aisle. Lay it out in front of the altar. Family sitting up there crying and carrying on. And we supposed to get up and hallucinate a life for you you never lived. I mean, most 
folks shouldn't even have a funeral. Most folks should go straight from the mall to the cemetery. Because most folks haven't done anything anybody care about but them. Got them a nice house, them a nice car. Won't mean nothing two minutes after you dead. As soon as you die, your house will go on the market. We'll ride in San Diego to L.A. in your car and never change registration until we have to. The only thing that will matter two minutes after you gone is if you've done something that's important a little more than just you. If you were involved in the spirit and move of your times to say that your life made a difference. So I come to urge you there is a battle in this country between the forces that want to see what is fair and just for all and those that want to see what is fair and just for the few. It's a battle that has gone on since the beginning of this country. It has manifested itself in this generation again. It has come to your town in the form of a referendum. It's come to your town in the form of unreasonable demands on working class people. History will judge where you stood, and history will also judge if you did not stand. Let history mark you present and mark you clear on which side you are. Don't score for the other side and tell us you're a great three-pointer. Because if you're not scoring for us, why do we care how good you are if your points don't go on our side of the scorecard? We suffered. We, in many cases, died. We went to jail. Some gave up their careers so that you would have opportunities they didn't have. They did not make those sacrifices for you to get in those positions and go to sleep or become inactive. And let me say this lastly. Don't, if you're afraid to fight, don't act like you got a new strategy. Don't act like, well, I'm doing it this way. You don't know I, I've got my own way of doing things. If you're scared, say you're scared. Don't act like you done figured out something we can't figure out. Just say I'm scared and sit down and shut up and let somebody that's not scared stand up and do what got to be done. This ain't no time for no cute double talking and back sliding. You got to stand up because the other side of this is standing up the arrogance of people to demand the right to make all of the money and pay few of the taxes, the, the right they want to demand, to outsource jobs and the money, and then have the nerve to say you're not a patriot unless you break people that have already been broken and unless you turn on those that have already sacrificed. Having a conversation with the right wing, I tell Lee all the time, is like having a conversation with a chicken and a pig. The discussion is that they are going to get ready for breakfast. But they're going to have a ham and egg sandwich for breakfast. Well, it's not an equal discussion. The pig can say, let's do it. The chicken can say, let's do it. But it's not equal sacrifice. Because all the chicken got to do is lay an egg. The pig going to lose a leg. The rich talking about maybe laying an egg. They talking about taking our legs and then calling that shared sacrifice. That is not shared sacrifice. That's a three card Monte game. And we must stand up, we must fight back, we must not be afraid, we must stand up in the tradition of those that made it for us in the first place. Thank you and God bless you.